Good morning, afternoon, or evening, everybody. Welcome to session four for the NASA Aquarius Data Training Webinar Series. This is your host, Jennifer Brennan. It's 2 p.m. Eastern Daylight Savings Time, so let's get started. Uh, first, what I'd like to do is go over a few of the logistics related to this webinar. <clears throat> Excuse me. To ensure best audio experience, the conference has been placed in silent mode. However, if you have any issues or you have questions, what I'd like for you to do is uh, enter those into the Q&A pod located on the lower right-hand side of your screen. This works like a chat. This webinar is being recorded, and what I'll do is I'll post it both to our online Adobe Connect webinar catalog as well as to our NASA Earth Data YouTube channel within a couple of days of completion. And then additionally, I have been sending this out to um, all of the registrants you know, once the direct link has become available. Presentation and video files, you're going for today's session, what you'll do, since it's a slightly different format, you're going to uh, download those from the wiki. Okay, if anyone has any issues with that, let me know. So today's session, again, is the virtual poster session. This should last approximately one to one and a half hours, hours long, and will include an evaluation survey at the end. This hour, this hour is allocated to the participant presentations and the evaluation period. So each of our speakers will have five minutes of speaking time with an additional three minutes for the Q&A. If you are listening to audio via telecon or dialed in via telephone, you may ask your question during the question and answer period by pressing star six. And this is also true for our presenters, okay, to unmute yourselves to speak when it's your time. You will then press star six. If you're only listening to audio by way of the computer, I would ask that you please type any of your questions into the Q&A pod. Um, speakers, I'd also like for you to introduce yourselves, you know, um, just really briefly before discussing your results. After our poster session, participants have finished their presentations today. We will present an evaluation for this training series. And we really do appreciate your input on this survey so that we can incorporate any lessons learned and uh, you know, have your thoughts on how to improve inf information about what worked and what you thought did not work so that we may incorporate this information into future training sessions. As was the case with all the other sessions, you will have an opportunity to ask your questions throughout all portions of today's webinar by using the Q&A pod. Questions will not be answered using the raising hand function. It has been disabled. Annette de Chiron, who is the NASA Aquarius Science Communications Lead, located at the University of Maine, will kick off today's session by going over the outline for today. Annette? Hi, everybody, and welcome to the public. I'm excited to um, share some of the products that have been developed over the um, advice webinar series with you. Um, you're now seeing the, the outline. Um, so we started with introductions, housekeeping, and logistics. I think we're, we got those done quicker than we had anticipated, so that's, we're a little ahead of schedule. But you can see the uh, lineup uh, after that, and I'm going to apologize in advance for anybody whose last name I don't pronounce properly, or first name for that matter. We're going to start with Angel Amoris, um, who is going to show some of the work that he's done. That will be followed by uh, the work of Heidi Bernasconi, uh, she is not able to be here today, so I'm going to present things for her. Um, I also uh, might not be able to answer questions you have of her, but you will certainly make note of them and pass them along um, if, if you have any of those. Next is Laura Ruiz Echeverry, um, who will be presenting her work, followed by Cheng Zhang, who has uh, two types of things to show us, um, videos, um, and then an app that has been developed, and Carla is going to be um, we hope, <laughs> fingers crossed, can be able to share that with you as well. So that's, that's the, the, the present, presentations coming up. As uh, Jennifer just said, it's going to be about five minutes for, for presentation plus three minutes of Q&A. Um, we're probably not going to be super strict about that, but please um, do try and keep, uh, with the Q&A part, but please do try and keep the presentations to about five minutes. And then as uh, pointed out earlier, there'll be a final evaluation There'll be a URL that you can click on and complete the final evaluation using SurveyMonkey. And we really do hope that you will be able to do that and give us some feedback um, because uh, that will help us do a better job in the future. So with that, uh, I think with Angel's up next. So um, if you would please, each of the presenters, please introduce yourself a little brief, um, you know, 
what, what institution you're at, and, and um, that would be very helpful for everybody. So go ahead, and thanks very much. And just a reminder for all of our speakers, what you'll need to do is press star six on your telephone to unmute yourself to be able to speak. Um, you'll also need to provide me with a verbal transition, some sort of cue that it's time to switch to your next animation. Okay, Angel? And if you'd like me to press play for your animations, let me know. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Fantastic. Perfect. So you can put my first video while I'm talking. So, well, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm uh, Angel Amores, Angel, and I'm a postdoctoral researcher in the International Pacific Research Center in the University of Hawaii. So, uh, today the idea I had is to check if in the Aquarius data there is a mesoscale signal. And more precisely, if there is signal of mesoscale eddies in the North Atlantic subtropical gyre, that is the region that we can observe in the in the video. Uh, as we have different backgrounds, so I will try to define a bit what is mesoscale. Mesoscale is uh, scales around 100 kilometers, and um, these are vortex formed in the in the global ocean due to the, the currents and different of uh, density that can travel uh, long distances and can live for for a long time. So, uh, Jennifer, if you, if you can uh, put the same video again, just looping. Yeah. Um, so, as we can see in the video, uh, there is kind of mesoscale structures, scales around, uh, uh, structures around 100 kilometers, but we cannot see uh, nothing with similar shape to a vortex or with circular shapes. And per perhaps we cannot see it because uh, we don't know where those eddies are. Uh, and that's why I plot on top of this of this salinity field the eddy trajectories uh, computed from sea level anomaly maps. So this is what we can see in the next video. Talk for Heidi is a flat-out PowerPoint, so it, that'll give um, Jennifer behind-the-scenes time to work through the video. So a little change. Okay. So um, I'm giving this talk on behalf of um, the advice participant Heidi Bernasconi, who hails from Clarkstown, New York. Um, so that's she wasn't able to make it today, uh, so she gave me permission to give this talk for her. And I'm going to go ahead and advance the slide myself. So about Heidi, Heidi is a Clarkstown North High School teacher. Uh, she teaches biology and marine biology, and she's a Google for Education certified trainer. She has gotten some grants. She has the Rockland Community Foundation Innovative Teacher Grant in 2012, and the Lower Hudson Regional Information Center Pioneer Award in 2015. And those two uh, images at the bottom are Heidi receiving her awards. She, uh, she attended advice, and she, uh, from that, she has created some products. So she used the live access server that was uh, used in the homework number one to create global maps of salinity, temperature, and surface winds. And so there's uh, salinity, temperature, and surface winds. And what is she doing with that? She's actually had a Google form. So uh, Heidi seems to be, you know, she's very uh, uh, tied into using the internet, and so she has created a Google form which has a pretest for the students, so to figure out their prior knowledge, so she's collecting um, information about that. And then she has reference materials um, from this Google form, and this is just the top of one of the pages um, she links to called Abiotic Factors. And she's also developed an online worksheet that prompts students to describe the patterns seen within each of the maps that we just looked at, hypothesize about which abiotic factor each map represents. So she doesn't tell them ahead of time what the maps are. She has them look at the patterns and then guess what the, map, the maps are representing. And then she's asking them, finally, to focus on areas of coral reef systems to, to compare with other ecosystems that her class has previously discussed. She also um, downloaded data, salinity data, from the PODAC to make a Google Earth movie. And so in this, uh, she has a salt marsh that her students have collected data from. 
and she compares that with other ecosystems. So basically, here's one, a couple of screen grabs. Here's the salt marsh um, that they visited, and here is uh, you know, basically the, the um, Atlantic Ocean. And she can go around on this Google Earth map and compare why they are the same or why they're different. And she uses this as a prompt to discuss factors that influence salinity patterns, including wind, evaporation, downwelling, et cetera. Um, so she, Heidi was kind enough to share her advice, uh, thoughts with us in advance. And she says, um, I'm just, these are all quotes, I just want to thank you for offering this webinar class. As a high school teacher, I felt at first that I was probably was going to be out of my league. However, I'm learning so many new tools and ways to use real data in my classroom. I'm really enjoying the homework tutorials. I've saved them all so I can keep going back to them. What I like most is that you have offered the tut three tutorials for each step, written down instructions, step-by-step -step instructions with pictures, and video instructions. As a teacher, I feel you have hit every learning style with the tutorials. I have saved them all so I can go back to them. And the reason I shared this with everybody here today is that um, you know, some of you probably teach or will teach in the future. And one of the things that Heidi brings up that's very important is when you offer information, offering it in different um, uh, ways, written, visual, pictures, and that kind of thing are very helpful. Some people learn better reading, and some people learn better by looking at pictures. And so that's just something that, that a teacher like Heidi knows, but those of us who weren't trained teachers might not. So, um, so that is what I have to present for Heidi. Does anybody have any questions that you would like to me or try and, and, and um, answer for Heidi? or um, I could pass them along to her if I cannot answer them for her. And so uh, I think people can you hit star six to unmute yourself if you, you're using the phone to call in, or you could type into the chat box. Um, we'll give it another minute uh, to see if there's any questions for the materials that I presented for Heidi. Okay, so I'm, I'm seeing no questions and not hearing them. So what I'm going to do, I have a, a couple more or a few more slides, um, just because uh, I thought maybe we might. This it's, it's harder to ask questions to the person who's not here. So since we had this uh, example from a high school using Aquarius data from one of our advice participants, I'm going to show you another use of Aquarius data and the live access server for students. And um, this was a. a um, an activity that was developed by um, my, my team here at UMaine, and it's uh, being offered by my NASA data. Uh, and it's called Using Hobmuller Plots to Better Understand Temperature and Salinity. The purpose is for students to learn about Hobmuller Plots, and the grade level that we've, we've pitched this at is uh, grades 10 through 12. The time to complete the lesson is 50 to 60 minutes. And we've also made it available in Spanish language, so if people want to uh, have Folks, their Spanish-speaking friends learn about Hobmuller plots. Uh, that's available too. The on, on the the next slides, you'll see that the URL for the lesson is offered at the bottom right. So, um, because this is um, aimed at high school kids, we started out with a premise where Naomi, Mark, and Sammy meet while playing video games online. And then, in trying to schedule their games together, they discover not only do they live in the same time zone, but they all live along the same line of longitude. And that's where Naomi, Mark, and Sammy live on this line of longitude. So uh, while they're playing the games and they're chatting, they start talking about their local climates. Naomi's talking about, oh, it's so cold here in the winter, and it gets really hot in the summer. And Sammy's talking about, who lives at the lowest uh, latitude, is talking about how it's always warm and it never freezes, and Mark's right in the middle. And so they start, they're all kind of a little geeky and like data, so they try and figure out what's the plot that would help them see the differences or in their um, climates, uh, and they decide they find out about a Hobmuller plot. I'm like, okay, well, let's try that. And so this is an example of how they would plot their temperature data for their home uh, town latitudes along the same longitude. Uh, the lesson, since it is trying to get people to use NASA data, they, they basically go from that temperature data to also um, looking at Aquarius salinity um, and trim precipitation along uh, 27 degrees west longitude, which is in the Atlantic Ocean. And it's between um, 
I think 35 uh, south and 35 north la uh, latitude. So this is a, a basically a Hobmuller plot that is um, prompted for the students to do in, in this lesson. So the take home message, and Heidi and I um, both feel very strongly about this, is using science data and tools in high schools can help better prepare tomorrow's workforce. And so um, innovative teachers like Heidi are really trying to get students to understand how to use these tools when they're young so that when we maybe see them at the university level that they are well prepared to be the scientists of tomorrow. So that is the end of this presentation. Does anybody have any questions before we get back to um, Anko? So remember, everybody, what you'll do is you'll press the star or the asterisk sign on your phone and then the six, and that should unmute you if you have questions. Okay, so I think that there's going to be no questions, so we can go back to the first presentation. And I, I, I understand that Jennifer thinks she figures out what the culprit was, so we'll try again. And thanks for your patience. Yes, thank you very much. All right, are you ready? Well, here's hey, video yeah. number two. Can you hear me again? Yes, we can hear you. Perfect. So uh, here in the second video we have exactly the, the same field, the same salinity field, but uh, on top I have uh, plot the trajectories of the eddies. Uh, and again, we cannot see any clear signal of salinity below this, under the, the eddies. So um, what I thought is uh, that maybe this could be uh, because uh, the footprint of the satellite is around 150 kilometers, if I'm not wrong, uh, and, it, uh, and this is uh, larger than the structures we are looking for. So maybe we cannot resolve them. Or maybe it could be uh, because the largest case signal is hiding the, the signal of the eddies. So uh, that's why I decided to, to filter out the largest scale of uh, the salinity fields. And I plot the eddy trajectories on top of the high uh, filtered salinity field. So this is uh, the next video. So here we have the, the high-pass filtered salinity field, so the large scale is removed. Uh, and again, we have on top the, the trajectories of this uh, mesoscale vortex. vortex. So uh, again, we cannot see nothing clear following these, these areas. So uh, perhaps the, this approach is not correct, so we cannot see the, the AD signal. So uh, what I did now, uh, you can put the next slide, is uh, change the way I was computing this. So I could uh, I cut the pieces of the of the sea surface salinity field near these uh, eddy composites or near these these eddy centers, and I uh, average them together. Uh, following the procedure you can see here in the in in this slide. And the result is the is in the next image. If you can put the next image, please. Yeah. So after doing this, uh, as we can see, is that a beautiful eddy salinity structure appears. So here we have uh, the eddy composites for the northern region of the North Atlantic Subtropical Gyre in the in the upper part of the panel and also uh, for the southern region of the North Atlantic Subtropical Gyre in the, in the part of, of down of this, of this uh, image. So let's center just in the, in the decomposite from the northern part of the North Atlantic Subtropical Gyre, that is the one uh, of the left in the, in the upper corner. So we can see uh, that uh, it has a large positive salinity anomalies, anomaly near the center, uh, Follow, followed with uh, a negative one, and this pattern appears. Uh, if, if we remember that we are in the northern part of the North Atlantic Subtropical Gyre, the salinity is uh, larger in in the southern part of the of the of the eddy, and and is fresher in the northern part. 
So when the eddy is spinning, it is advecting the saltier water from, north, from southward towards the north and the fresher water from north towards the south. And this is when this, this pattern appears. So the take-home message is that despite the horizontal resolution of Aquarius data uh, seems not to be enough to, come to capture the mesoscale signal, it appears when we perform uh, an appropriate data analysis. And that's all what I wanted to show you today. Okay, wonderful. Are there any questions? For those of you who are dialed into the telecon, remember you will press star six. For those of you listening to audio by way of the um, computer, just enter your question into the Q&A pod and I will read it aloud to Angel and have him answer for, for us. Hi, Jennifer. This is Jorge. Can I just make a comment? Sure, of course, Jorge. Yeah. By the way, great, great presentation. Uh, one of the issues is, yes, I think the resolution is basically, even if you look at the Gulf streams as you showed, where you have a lot of mesoscale variability, you still, you still even at, with those eddies, you can't really see them, define them in the uh, Aquarius data. But, but one, one thing to keep in mind that's exciting is the SMAP will actually be able to have a higher resolution of about a half a degree from 0 0.4 to about half of a degree. So actually one of the exciting things is that with the upcoming SMAP data, you actually should be able to see some of these uh, mesoscale variability. So I just wanted to pass yeah, that on yeah. to Angel. This is Vardis. I also had a uh, follow-on question for Ankiel. A uh, great presentation as well. Um, uh, I really enjoyed that. So in terms of the Aquarius data that you were using in your uh, video and also in your analysis, which particular products of the various Aquarius data sets uh, did you use? It's the, um, the level four is the one that is in the IPRC. I see. So, so you use the the optimally interpolated yeah, yeah, yeah. data, yeah, not, not data from, right? Not the mission data from from Podak. Yeah. Does yeah. the OI uh, smooth out potentially some of the the features? You know, at, the, at that kind of scale that you're looking for, perhaps. Uh, I'm I'm not aware of of the scale of the optimal interpolation, but uh, for uh -huh. sure that it it uh, it smooths the structure because. Yeah, I, I don't know the scale, but it's it super smooth. It. Yeah, it would be interesting to see how how you know your analysis would compare with the actual sort of uh, unsmooth, the sort of the native Aquarius uh, level three data that that are available. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it could be interesting doing the same analysis. Yeah, great, great presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, the, just one other quick thing. You actually. Mm -hmm. You actually should be able to see the, the eddies. It's a little bit more difficult to work with level two data. But if the actual track, the actual swath crosses an eddy, you might want to compare it and, and see if you can actually see the eddies that you've shown. Uh, because it, you know, under those circumstances, you probably, with the long track resolution, you probably will be able to pick up the, you know, an eddy. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But that requires, yeah, that requires a little bit, you know, working with the level two data, which is a little bit more difficult to deal with. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Jorge and Vardis, and also uh, Angel. And then our next speaker today is Laura Ruiz Echeverry. I hope I'm saying that properly. So, Laura? Yes. Yes, I'm here. You can hear me? Yes, we can hear can you. Can you hear me? Yeah, you you pronounce it correctly. Okay, would you like I, would you like me to press play for your uh, animation? Yeah, uh, well, as you already mentioned, I am Laura. I am a, a postdoc fellow, and I'm working uh, in International Pacific Research Center as Angel. And here, my idea is to show a preliminary result from what I'm doing now. This is my two, my second month as a fellow researcher. So it's 
brand new what I'm doing now. And first I want to present a movie that I that I did with the with the Panoply uh, app. And this is the magnitude of the gradient of the sea surface salinity. The gradient represents the ratio of the ocean where you have the large variation of the variable, in this case the salinity, in a few kilometers. And the red colors are indicated the regions where the magnitude is bigger and the blue colors the minor sea surface salinity gradient. And this is for the the whole entire period of Aquarius, and you can see that here in the in the equatorial region, you have a a really a really interesting signal that is changing along along the period, in particular in the Amazon region and also in the other side of the in the Pacific equatorial region near Panama uh, country. Then you have also a, a nice signal in the Indian Ocean that is changing, and also in the circumpolar region in the South Atlantic, where you have a, a maximum signal that is changing in time, and you have also like a eddies in some periods. Um, based based on this video, I. I took some particular random date where I saw this particular signal and then tried to compare it with the Aquarius, uh, oh, sorry, with Oscar velocity vectors. And well, this video is one minute, so you you still can see how it's changing the the gradient, the magnitude of the gradient of the sea surface salinity. Also here is near the South Atlantic uh, continental shelf. You also have a, sometimes a, a change in the magnitude. And now the the following pictures. Let's see. This is one day in particular. This is uh, February 19 for 2012. This is, again, the, mag the uh, magnitude of the sea surface salinity gradient. And overlaid this map, I have I got the Oscar velocity for the, the nearest date. The problem is the Aquarius has their weekly maps, and Oscar are five days maps. So in some cases, you have a different from one day or two days. In this case, the Aquarius data from 19 of February and the Oscar data for 20. But I like this date in particular because here in around 8 and 8 north and 0, you have a signal near the coast, a, um, a maximum in the gradient that corresponds with the Aquarius, sorry, the Oscar current, and if you go to the second figure or the third one, I don't remember the order. Yes, it's okay. This is for 2014. For November, not February, the signal, the maximum gradient has changed, and also the the Oscar current. So, in this case, I think this must be a interaction between the, the, the current and the sea surface salinity gradient. The, sal, the depends of the ratio, the, sal, the salinity signal can be, cannot be so strong as the temperature, so maybe the current, there is not an answer, but in this case, I think the, the signal in the gradient is related with the current in that ratio. I also plot another two random dates. This is from the Southern Ocean, here in, in 48 South and 15 East. You have as a, as a eddy signal, but the current doesn't show that. 
So maybe that's one of the cases that, uh, as um, Angel mentioned before, that depending on how you process the data, you can see that uh, with Aquarius data you can see an eddy or not. And so I think in this case, maybe the currents are isolated, different kind of mass of water. And you have this signal in the salinity, but not, but maybe you, you can see it in the temperature. So if the, this is something that I must continue to further study. And the last example is for also South Atlantic Ocean. And here you have also two two two, two special characteristics like was an eddy, but I don't think that it's an eddy because the current doesn't show that. And here in 40 south degrees near the so 40 south degree and I think 50 west, you have a big uh, maximum gradient. And the currents are corresponding with that gradient that shows that you have in the in the north you have the Brazil current that is uh, um, follow the the shear break and meet the the Malvinas current from the south and here in particular where you you see the maximum gradient maybe you are, you you are observing that there is a mix of water from the shelf from Brazil and, and Malvinas current. So that's why you have a signal, a change in the salinity in this in this part that is corresponds with the with the with the flow, with the current that we observe here. As I already said before, this is preliminary result that I'm working on. And I think the the tech message from this is that with the Grad, the, with the sea surface energy gradient, you can observe a lot of uh, interesting patterns that are, they will be interesting to study because, in general, fronts are associated with the difference in, in water masses that also influence the, the biology in the water because it depends of the it depends of the characteristics of the water. You can have different phytoplankton. A chlorophyll, and that will start to change all the the change food in in the talking about fishes. Um, and that is it. Okay, thank you, Laura. Does anybody have any questions for Laura? Remember to star six to unmute yourself. Or if you have a question and you're conducting audio by way of your computer, just type it into the Q&A pod, and I will read the question aloud. Any questions? Just a comment, Jennifer. Um, very impressive work. <laughs> um, Laura, one, one of the things that I, I noticed in the uh, gradients is, is, is fascinating. You see these banded structures in the salinity gradients that you yeah. also see in sea surface temperature gradients. There's a, yeah. there's, a, there's a tremendous, I don't know, I mean, it's just, let's collaborate. <laughs> yeah, that, okay. <laughs> fascinating work. This is really impressive. I, have, I, have, I hadn't seen the, I hadn't seen anyone, anyone yet look at the uh, SS, at the sea surface salinity gradients. Just a, a quick technical question. How did you do, calculate the gradients? Did you use, just use a finite difference, centered finite difference method or something else? Uh, yeah, I did uh, the difference in along the, the latitude and along the, okay. the longitude. Okay. And, and from the magnitude, then I, I, I did uh, the square of, of the meridional gradient plus a uh, sonar gradient. Okay. This is the max. And I also compare it with the sea surface energy, but only the, the mean field. I, this is from each weekly map, but when I compare it with the salinity, I did the temporal mean of one year, and then the okay. mean. So I'm starting with that because 
as you said, you, the, the pattern is really interesting. You have a lot of things that I think something will be have to be connected with with temperature, or maybe in some areas the salinity is the the dominant uh, variable. I right. don't know. <laughs> right. Well, very impressive work. <laughs> Congratulations. Yeah. Thank you. Just to follow up uh, comment and, and question, this is Vardis from, from the PODAC. Um, yes, I mean, I, I, have, I have not seen uh, uh, gradient representation of salinity uh, so far. So this, is, this was very illuminating to me to see all of that interesting structure. And your, the overlaying of the OSCAR data, uh, the surface current information, the coherence between these fields uh, is is very interesting and, and and quite impressive. So congratulations on that. Uh, yeah. I had the same question for you as I had for Angel, and it's a I guess a general comment as well. When making these types of presentations, it's always and and when using satellite imagery products or other you know data sets, it's always a good idea to you know to to mention specifically which data set you are using, you know, because there are multiple Aquarius uh, data data products out there, uh, you know, the mission data and then the uh, level four optimal interpolation. I'm assuming you use the the OI data set from Hawaii. Is that is that true? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I use that, yeah. and I I haven't shown here, but I did the um, the mean gradient from the uh, L2 product, a long track data, oh, I also okay. tried that. Okay. And it's, you have a lot of, of noise because sure. all, uh, optimal interpolation have a, uh, is more smooth than sure. the long track data, but I tried that also, as well. Sure. So just a you know, general recommendation uh, when, you, when you make these presentations, always you know, mention first, first off which data sets you're using like that people know in advance. But great presentation. Thank you. Thank you. OK, thank you, Laura. And with that, are there any other questions for Laura? If not, what we will do is move to our uh, next speaker, Cheng Zhang from Goddard Space Flight Center. Do I have that right, Cheng? Uh, yes. OK. Uh, hello, this is Cheng. Uh, I'm from um, um, Scientific Visualization Studio at Goddard. Um, uh, here, I uh, first I post uh, um, four uh, Aquarius um, animation, and all in the uh, MOAD projection. Um, their uh, salinity, um, sea surface temperature, and uh, um, soil moisture, and uh, sea surface uh, density. And when I uh, got this uh, task, I work on those uh, data. Um, to be frankly, I have no idea um, what the relationship between uh, these um, uh, parameters. And I think this, um, this online training uh, uh, really opened my mind, uh, opened my eyes. And I'm glad to uh, learn a lot of stuff um, from the uh, Field, from a few scientists, um, and still, uh, I'm not sure how. Um, uh, like, uh, I'm being given data about um, sea surface uh, density. Uh, I'm not sure how this uh, related to, uh, for example, sea surface uh, salinity, temperature, or other um, uh, parameters. And I wonder if any uh, scientist in this field can can explain, can give some more information about that. So, Shang, could you let me know when you'd like me to press play for your animations? I haven't uh, sure. started sure. any of those. Sorry. That's OK, uh -huh. no problem. Mm -hmm. OK, shall I start animation number one? Sure. OK, Go ahead. great. Mm -hmm. uh, this is, uh, I think, it's, uh, soy moisture. Uh, this is from uh, all the uh, four animation is, uh, is about the whole life uh, time of Aquarius.
when I work on this um, uh, animations, I find out that maybe, you know, um, bring up a, a two or more uh, different uh, parameter. For example, uh, the soil moisture, maybe temperature uh, together to show uh, there's a relationship. Maybe that's just, uh, that that would be helpful uh, per, uh, for the uh, pre presenters. So that's just, um, uh, uh, make me to think about the create uh, uh, application about uh, Aquarius uh, data animations. This is the next. Uh, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, uh, the Aquarius applications. Um, we actually can go to the next animation if it's, it's, it, it, yeah. Okay. This is uh, the uh, surface uh, density. And here I'm not quite sure what this, uh, what information show here. The density here, uh, how they, this uh, scientist interpreted about this uh, density things. So I, I, this is Annette. Um, I think uh, Jorge or mm -hmm. Bart, if you want to explain um, how density are calculated for Aquarius uh, and, and what the meaning is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, re remember that uh, density is basically, in the ocean, is basically a function of temperature and salinity. Mm -hmm. So as long as you have you know, a temperature value and a salinity value, you can calculate mm -hmm. a density through the equation of what we call the equation of state. Mm -hmm. which relates, you know, it, it's pretty much a linear equation that relates, you know, whatever the temperature and the, and the uh, salinity is to density. And the main, obviously the main, you know, thing you want with density is to understand how, how things move also vertically in the ocean. It controls what we call the buoyancy. So, uh, uh -huh. but yeah, it's basically related to density through uh, this equation of state that relates temperature and salinity to, the, to density. I see. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so um, areas where the, the density is higher, water will tend to sink. And mm -hmm. the purple, the lower is where water will tend to float. And as uh, Jorge uh -huh. points out, it's really um, important in terms of initiating uh, circulation uh, at the surface. So uh, okay. these data are super important. And you can see from the patterns that a lot of the, the lighter, buoy, less dense buoy, mm -hmm. uh, buoyant water are along the hot, um, rainy tropics. And yeah. then you get the sinking uh, denser water at higher latitudes. Oh, I see. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. It's, I think this is really related to uh, what is, uh, the, uh, I'm not sure how to say it. It's, I heard about like um, uh, the war, uh, in ocean, the water also uh, uh, kind of move uh, vertically. Is that, this is related to that? Yes, exactly. Uh, okay, you hit okay. the nail on the head. And one of the uh, one of the areas of a lot of research right now mm -hmm. is, in fact, in the North Atlantic, you you have you know ice that forms and ice that melts. When ice mm -hmm. melts, it basically adds water, so density decreases. When ice forms, you're basically extracting water, but mm -hmm. the salt doesn't freeze, <laughs> so density uh -huh. actually increases. Well, that, that relationship in the North Atlantic between freezing and melting, and obviously temperature is a big factor in that also, has a huge interplay on what we call the Atlantic Meridiano overturning circulation, which is simply just a, a fancy word for saying that water usually sinks in the North Atlantic where it's cold and dense, and it usually rises in the you know, equatorial regions where it's warmer, but of course, a huge area of research because of issues of climate and all of that is, in fact, mm -hmm. how density changes could change this vertical motion of water, especially, you know, specifically the, the Atlantic Ocean is one very critical case. Mm -hmm. I see. I just just lastly, um, going off of that theme, you'll notice that in the North Atlantic, the water is much denser than in the North Pacific. 
And then the mm -hmm. second place that it's the densest is in Antarctica. And there's the two main places in the globe where your deep water is going to form. And mm -hmm. so kind of bouncing off that comment about as ice melts, the worry is that the density in the North Atlantic might decrease too much so you don't get that deep water formation. Uh -huh. And uh, Hollywood did a really good job of <laughs> extrapolating that in um, the Day After Tomorrow movie. <laughs> uh, what movie? Which, it's called The Day After Tomorrow. And basically, um, the Gulf Stream shuts down and, you know, a glacial period begins. It's not going to happen uh -huh. like that. But that is kind of that whole science thing that we're trying to tease mm -hmm. apart is what happens, say, if all of Greenland melts and you get... Um, you know, this flood of fresh water into the North mm -hmm. Atlantic, this critical area of deep water formation. Ah. So we have another comment from one of our uh, mm -hmm. speakers. Angel, would you like to go ahead? Yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Mm-hmm. Yes, yeah. we can. Yeah. Uh, uh, can you put the, can you play again the video? I was looking at the Galapagos, and it's amazing how uh, uh, such a small islands affect the the pattern of the of the salinity uh, of the density. I was just looking to this area, and you see, it? it's amazing. It's very small. It, it, they are very small, but they affect. Uh, which one? Which part you mentioned? The Galapagos Island is just uh, near. I don't know, uh, Chile maybe. No. Oh, okay. Panama, near the Panama? Yeah, uh -huh. there. Uh -huh. And they are very, very small, but they affect a lot to the, I mean, oh. to the density pattern. I don't know if maybe it's an artifact of the color scale or something. But Okay, thank you, Angel. Are there any other questions or comments before we move to the third animation? Anybody? Yeah, I just wanted to quickly, Jennifer, add also, because you showed such a nice video also of soil moisture. And, and one of the areas that people are looking at now is, in fact, how some major flooding events on land, such as we've had recently in Texas, you know, affect salinity through river discharge. So that's a very nice animation, and that's going to be an issue of research in the future, combining, you know, understanding soil moisture on land due to flooding events and how it affects river discharge and how it then affects the salinity in the oceans. So very nice. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, wonderful. Shall we move to the third animation? Sure. I think um, the probably the time, uh, if... Um, um, well, so you're our final speaker for today, so oh, okay. you know we're we're doing we're still doing okay. I mean, Carla and okay. uh, Annette, what do you think? Yeah, if uh, it's, it's it's up to Chang if she'd like to go to the app, we can, or if we want to show a couple more movies and then go to the app, we do have time. Okay, then so uh, uh, Jennifer, uh, could you please yeah? So th this is a uh, uh, salinity. Um, I think this one is uh, um, Dr. Lee. So in the first class, we we seen this before. Yeah, we saw this before. Yeah. Um, the next probably is the uh, the temperature. Yeah, the sea surface temperature. The scale is not correct, I guess. And uh, when I got uh, the color table, uh, the color bar, uh, the uh, scientist has a different uh, color bar. Uh, I just tried to, um, the, toward the cold temperature, the original temp, uh, the color bar is more toward the white. So I, I changed that because um, uh, here the, the white to indicate um, uh, kind of a frozen or ice things uh, around them, you know the two, uh, like a, a pole area. So that's as I change that. And uh, um, um, on the other hand, the hot temperature, they have something uh, kind of very um, 
it's easy to confuse. So both ends I change uh, the color bar. So that's why uh, you probably see this uh, uh, see surface uh, temperature maybe a little bit different from uh, you know the popular one used in a scientist uh, community. So, so can we go to uh, go ahead? Yeah. We do have a comment, and it, and mm -hmm. it might be, you know, mm -hmm. I will leave it to one of the you know, scientists to speak to, but mm -hmm. the conversion of the color bar that you had converted to this, um, the comment mm -hmm. by Angel is that the ocean does mm -hmm. not get to 40 degrees Celsius and that it's, mm -hmm. you know, that it's not accurate. Okay. Yeah. It would, it would be a lot more saline if it did. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So yeah. this is this is a probably uh, you, you see the uh, t uh, the color bar here uh, from um, 32 to uh, 45. The, the color is not very uh, you know from that range is not very distinguishable for people to see. I think this is one problem. Yeah. Um, Even so like uh, as one of the scientists said, uh, it's not reached to 40 degree. So maybe there's a color. Uh, if that range can 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 put a more like a, a distinguishable color range over there, that probably can solve this problem. Right now it seems like a, the too too red over there. But I think that you know mm -hmm. even using the color bar where mm -hmm. white would be a higher sea surface temperature, I mean, the general mm -hmm. public can understand those types of things when you have mm -hmm. the information presented. At least that's okay. my experience with, you know, super sleuth types of activities with the general public. I see. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know how yeah. everyone else feels, the scientist yeah. or, or Annette. Um, when I uh, done this uh, animation, the first draft, uh, um, we, uh, we had some uh, scientists uh, on site and uh, comment on that, the, they suggest um, oh, uh, reversing just, it. Uh, take that part, uh, like a white part, uh, before it's indicated high high temperature. They said they told me to make it make it become a uh, dark red. That's just yeah. why I changed right. that. Yeah. The, the only mm -hmm. trouble is it almost appears as though ice is growing, and yeah. then um, you know you you almost might get the mm -hmm. wrong impression that there's another point to perhaps consider that mm -hmm. the public might actually view that white as the, the polar caps, right, uh -huh. uh, melting and then growing again, and that also would not be accurate. Yeah. Although that's uh, not your intent, just something to consider. Shall uh, we move along to the, are there any mm -hmm. questions about this, or shall we go ahead and move along to the app share? Yeah. Jorge or Vardis? Carla or Annette or anybody? No, we, can go, we can go ahead and go to the app. So, um, okay, that we... sounds great. All right, Carla, so I've got you set up with your share pod. Let's go to, okay. So this is, uh, I created uh, uh, one application include four, uh, eight uh, animations um, in, different, in two different uh, projections. So if you click on, so there's eight buttons, so you can click one of those buttons to show, uh, for example, right now, uh, the ten density. So you see the uh, density. Um, if you um, click some other, like a temperature in MOAD, uh, okay. Yeah. So the here is the temperature in Moab. And also, if you can, uh, I got a request like uh, they want uh, scientists want to zoom in particular area. Um, so in this case, um, I make it uh, um, become available by um, um, rolling the um, middle middle uh, button, a middle wheel. If you can. Color, can you move in, uh, like a uh, zoom in? Use a middle button, like the wheel. Oh, I, I don't have a mouse with a wheel on it right uh, now. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm trying to do it on yeah. my computer, but, it, but it's not mm -hmm. uh, letting me right now, sorry. Okay, so if you can, uh, assume you can zoom in. 
like uh, you can show a particular area. For example, as my uh, as I post the two uh, uh, like a three uh, two of the uh, zooming uh, uh, image in the wikis, you can zoom in uh, for a particular area if you're interested. Um, at that moment, if you want to see the same area uh, with some other like a parameter, for example, if you want to see the salinity in that area, so you just click the salinity button. Oh, you, you got it. You can zoom in. So the same thing, uh, kind of a, you can uh, zoom in and show particular area, but uh, in the same area, you if you click other buttons, they show different uh, parameters. For example, maybe a density or the temperature. Yeah, so you can see this allows you to compare. And the, um, the other idea is um, this is this app is just very um, preliminary. The other idea is uh, I can implement like uh, allow the two windows to show uh, side by side, so you can see um, uh, two parameter in the same period, maybe in the same area. You you can see uh, how, for example, how salinity, uh, uh, maybe how temperature affect the salinity, or you know show the relationship between the um, different uh, parameters or variables. And this is just like um, a pilot um, project. I would like to know how this, uh, uh, like scientists feel like how this is useful, or maybe some other features uh, you feel like this um, important should be added. Yeah. Well, this is Annette. Just before, um, I'm, I'm hoping that um, other folks mm -hmm. will weigh in as well for the scientific value. But you know, the the mm -hmm. talk that I gave the uh, um, earlier, um, the high school teacher Heidi, I'm sure mm -hmm. if she saw this, she would be squealing with delight because this is exactly the kind of thing that her students could use, mm -hmm. um, and uh, very straightforward and easy to navigate. And then your mm -hmm. idea of having it maybe a split screen where you can compare two mm -hmm. against each other would be very. Mm -hmm very educational for at least that audience. But yeah. I would love to hear yeah. from the scientists about um, other ideas. Uh -huh. uh, this is Artis. Just uh, a couple of comments. Again, mm -hmm. the I, I noticed on the uh, when you displayed the sea surface temperature, mm -hmm. the scale is, again, was, you know, the maximum was 45 Celsius, which is, mm -hmm. you know, unrealistic. So okay. just just you know, again, double check you know how that uh, scaling was was done. I mean, the actual structure of the data looks looks fine. It's just uh, yeah. how those uh, that scale you know the maximum was was computed. Uh, the other, th just a quick comment on your app, which is really nice. Uh, I agree, it would be nice to have a, a split screen so that you could show potentially you know you could compare two parameters side by side. Uh, the one thing I noticed is that when you go into the zoom mode, mm -hmm. you lose the, the 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 color bar, the you know the scale bar. Yeah. yeah. And so it would be it's always good you know when you're when you're looking at these types of data to have the the color bar separate. separate. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. That's exactly. So, also the time. Okay, right. Nice. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Uh -huh. So those are my only comments. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think I think it looks really. Re really good. Um, so yeah, thanks for that. That's interesting. Thank you. Uh, again, this is just um, uh, very uh, pre preliminary uh, at this uh, at this uh, stage. Um, definitely, there are a lot of uh, very interesting uh, you know feature can put on this. Uh, I think the comments is really really uh, really helpful. To, uh, for example, the time and the color bar should separate from. Uh, you know the the big screen. So maybe you put on the uh, the bottom. People can see what time and what the color uh, color bar being used for particular animations when you zoom in. Yeah. Thank you. This is Jennifer. I did have one mm -hmm. um, question. The intent to also have the capability down the road for um, you know people who are using this app to be able mm -hmm. to download the underlying data products. Uh, right now, it's not. Right now, I haven't uh, released yet. I think it's um, uh, uh, this is just uh, uh, my uh, kind of like experience. Right, right, sure, yeah. sure. 
Uh huh. But I if uh, if people, no. yeah, if people uh, like to um, like a current version, if they like, uh, I, I, of course, they can send me email. I can post, po um, uh, give them uh, like uh, this application if they want to try. We want to try to see anything if this app is, they they think is uh, useful. Uh, I, I'm glad to to provide them. Yeah. I think that this brought us again. This uh, that's an interesting comment, Jennifer, and I I, I agree that potentially this app could mm -hmm. be a, uh, a a means by which you know users could mm -hmm. uh, seeing these very interesting animations uh, could then be directed to the actual source data. For example, mm -hmm. at archives such as Podak for the for mm -hmm. salinity, temperature, and mm -hmm. and density type type information. And you know, soil moisture we don't have at the Podak, but that's at NSIDC. So what I'm saying is that you know your tool uh, it captures people's imagination, but then they they want to go that next step and mm -hmm. uh, ask you know how do I find the data? So maybe there could be a, a capability in your tool that mm -hmm. would allow user that would point them to the archive yeah. to the specific data. Uh, yeah. on which your animation is based. So that's just yeah. an extension to think about for the future. Yeah. I think it's a, that, that's very, yeah, it's, uh, like, a, uh, I think it's a, uh, that's very good because a lot of people, you know, didn't know, unless they're in this field, but most people, like, uh, in the general public, didn't know the where they can find the data. It's a very useful data. And I think it's the app, if the app can point to uh, where the data that come from that will be very helpful for them, and also the, this app can also be used in the iPad, uh, the mobile, uh, any mobile devices. As long as we have, we know the uh, uh, the uh, the target uh, devices, we can generate the app for that particular devices. So people just can carry around. It's very uh, convenient. You don't need to like sit in the uh, before the computer or some. To, to show this animation, yeah. Just a, a follow-up to, to, to my comment as well. You know, mm -hmm. at the top, uh, you, you say Aquarius project. Well, mm -hmm. people may ask, well, what, what is the Aquarius what? Yeah. project? Yeah. And so, you know, maybe through that, by just mm -hmm. clicking, by very simply just clicking on that, that mm -hmm. would take you to the, uh, to the Aquarius. Yeah mission yeah. website where they can oh, find yeah. out more information about. So, you know, these kind of tie-ins mm -hmm. to other resources related to Aquarius would be would be useful. Yes, yes, definitely, yeah. Okay, wonderful. I, can ahead. I make a comment? Of course, of course. Uh, I like the, the application, but I, I would include a few things. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know if they need if, if to include them. Uh, first, uh, change the center of the map because now it's centered in the Pacific, but maybe uh -huh. uh, just to allow like three different buttons to center mm -hmm. in the Pacific, center in the Atlantic, and center in the Indian Ocean, that are the three mm -hmm. main uh, oceans. Mm -hmm. Then uh, a control to be able to pause it or to move uh, frame by frame, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, and yeah. then uh, the idea of putting two different panels to compare is, is nice, but uh, I would like, uh, I would prefer to have like a color plot like this, for example, of salinity, and then on top a contour plot with temperature, or maybe compare the the, con the color plot of density with the contour plot of salinity, just to see if there is correlations or not. Or, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, yeah. These are the three comments. Mm -hmm. these are. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. This is really great feedback. Uh, and thank you, Chen. Um, thank you. So at this particular point, Annette and Carla, um, would you like to go ahead and move to our uh, evaluation period? I think that yes. concludes our, you know, all that of our speakers great. for today. And at this point, we will move to the evaluation. And uh, Annette, if you wanted to say a few words about this, I think that would be great. Thank you. First of all, before we go to the evaluation, I really want to thank so much the, our presenters and for sharing their work, for doing such a great job. And um, you know, it's been just really uh, heartwarming and great for us who, who, who planned this series. And it just makes us feel really gratified about having helped you to do this and letting you share it. So thank you so much. 
and all the people who participated, even if you didn't do the homework or present, um, we had a, a great bunch of people coming each week, and I hope that you guys got a lot out of it. Speaking of which, um, here is the URL for the survey. Um, it should take uh, 20 minutes or less to complete. Um, so please do consider uh, clicking on this link and doing our survey. And we want to thank you again um, for joining us, and we hope that you enjoyed it. And I, I don't know if um, Bardis and Jorge uh, or Leslie would like to chime in. Um, that would be great. Uh, this is Bardis. Just to say it's been a lot of fun, and uh, thank, thanks, everyone, for participating. And I particularly enjoyed the presentations today. I thought they were excellent. Keep up the good work. Yeah, I, I, this is, I go ahead. Go for it. Just to echo what uh, what Bodis was saying, I, I was so impressed today with all of the presentations and uh, even seeing some future science. Uh, very, very impressive and very impressive with all of the visualization stuff. Uh, thank you for uh, letting me be a part of this. Thank you. Yeah, I thought those of you who presented it today really knocked it out of the park. I was very, very impressed. Um, so nice work, and I hope you guys learned a lot and that you can continue to use uh, the advice resources as you move forward and forget things we've talked about and want a refresher. And yeah, so best of luck. Okay, so at this point, what I will do is. Uh, if there aren't any questions or anything, we'll log off from the telecon portion of the webinar, but I will leave the virtual meeting space open until 3.30 p.m. Eastern Time so that um, you may click on the link and take the survey. Thank you so much to everybody. And thank you, a big thank you to Jennifer for um, herding all the cats, as they say. And, and presenting this every week. You've done a fabulous job, and we, we haven't made it easy on you, but you did a great job. Thank you so much. Well, you are very welcome. All right, well, thanks, everybody. Uh, at this point, we will log off from the telecon. Goodbye. Goodbye, everybody. Mm -hmm. Thank you so Bye. much, Bye. presenters. Bye, everybody. Thank Bye. you. All right, bye-bye now.